We're going to talk about two things today. One is we're going to go over Half-Life. This is the second time, actually. And we're also going to discuss the idea of collision theory and what makes an effective collision. Well, first of all, hopefully you remember Half-Life is the time it takes for one of a half of a substance to either decay if it's a radioactive substance or react if it's a half-life, first order half-life reaction. We see here that this substance started off with this concentration initially, which is 0.02. At the end of one half-life, it should be down to one half that amount. So we see here, if you take one half of 0.02, there's one half, and there's the, the time for one half-life, which is 660 minutes. Notice the time it takes for that half to go down yet again is exactly the same amount. But it's going to, for two half-lives, it would be that number doubled. And then for three half-lives, you simply triple that number. So a half-life is consistent through the reaction time or the decay series of a radioactive substance. So a half-life is the time it takes for half of a sample to disappear. Uh, for first order reactions, the concept of half-life is super useful. So half-life. So we have one half of the substance reacts. There you go. That's one half-life. It goes down from 0.02 to 0.01, and then that's the reaction after one half life. So one half of, it, half of it's been consumed. It went from 0.02 to 0.01, and one half remains. We have this half life formula, which is remaining equals one half times the number of half lives. Now, now we've gone through actually two half lives. After two half lives, one fourth of the initial reactant remains. So we could say this is the remaining is one fourth, and it's one half times the number of half lives. So for this one, it would be to the second to the second order squared. Now we've gone to three half lives, so it's gone it's gone through three times, and this we have one eighth of the reactant remains, or one half cubed. So one half to the third power would be the amount that would be remaining. So if you took your initial mass or initial concentration. Multiply that by one eighth, or one half to the third, you would get the amount you have after three half lives. But you could do it again for another half life, which four half lives would be one sixteenth, and so one sixteenth times initial mass or the initial concentration would give you the number remaining after four half lives. Look at this problem: we have sugar; it's fermented in a first order process using a catalyst, and it produces a product. And so this, we have this reaction here where the rate equals K times the concentration of sugar, and this is a rate constant. What is the half-life for this reaction? We actually usually have this formula for this, so we need a formula linking half-life and rate constant. And the formula for this is half-life, which is T1 half, equals ln of 2 over K. We'd write the formula ln of 1 half equals minus K times T one half, which is the T one half right here, this represents half life. We rearrange that, we get this formula. Now notice if you took this, the 0.693, this number is the same as natural log of the number two. So natural log of two is 0.693. So a half life is equal to 0.693 or ln of two over the rate constant, which is K. So for sugar, simply what we do is take the 0.693 divided by the value of K, our rate constant, and we get the half-life in seconds, and we can also convert that to minutes. Half-life, time remaining for a half of a sample to disappear. Let's say we have the rate law and the constant. And the half-life we know is 35 minutes. When we start with 5 grams of sugar, how much of that sugar is left after 2 hours and 20 minutes? We figure out that total time. It's 140 minutes. So the solution to doing this is to divide the 140 by the 35, which gives us four half-lives. And the half-life, we know this is first order, and the time elapsed is 35 minutes. The mass left is 2.5 grams. And then after the second half-life, time elapsed is 70 minutes. Mass left is 1.25 grams. And we got the third half-life and the time elapsed and the mass left and finally the fourth half-life with the time elapsed and the mass left what you would do is basically this is going to be 1 16th times an original mass which is five grams and so you simply say the amount remaining is equal to one half 
uh, to the power of the number half-life, so it's 1 16th times 5, and that gives us the 0 0.313. This also works for radioactive elements. Uh, the radioactive decay of any substance follows a half-life. So let's say if you're uranium-238 going to another element, and that's half-life. Notice this is incredibly long. It's in years. And then we can also do it for carbon dating. This is how they, uh, what they carbon date or organic substances or, or anything from a living substance. And also you could do it for iodine, which is very quick. Iodine is used in medical procedures as a tracer, and it has a half-life of a number of days. And also, for example, element ciborium. Radioactive decay is always a first-order process. And for example, this substance, tritium, which is hydrogen-3, has a half-life of 12.3 years. So if you have 1.50 milligrams of tritium, how much is left after 49.2 years? So what you need to do is figure out, well, how many half-lives is that? So what you do is divide ln of the concentration of A over ln concentration of AO equals minus KT. So we know both those, both those values, the initial concentration is 0.15 milligrams, initial amount. We know the time. And so we can, or we can calculate the rate constant because we know the half-life. And therefore, the rate constant is 0 0.0564 years to the negative one and now we plug that into our equation we find that the value is negative 2.77 after that we plug it in and we find the fraction remaining is 0.0625 so here's another way to do it if you have 0.15 milligrams of tritium and the fraction remaining is this because if we start with 1.5 milligrams then at a0 it's going to be 0.094 one milligrams. Notice that at 49.2 years, you've gone through exactly four half-lives. So an easy way to think about this is 1.5 milligrams goes to 0.75. That's one half-life. Now we need to split it in half again. That's two half-lives. Split it in half again. That's three half-lives. Split it in half again. And now we have four half-lives. And so the fraction remaining after four half-lives would be one half to the number of half-lives, which is four which would be 1 16th times initial mass, gives us the amount of the radioactive tritium that's remaining. And last thing we're going to do is look at some mechanisms that are important for the reactions to occur. So mechanisms are how reactions are, reactants are converted to products at the molecular level. So we see we have a unimolecular and bimolecular process, and rate laws are important, but also the mechanism is important for reaction. So this is how the experiment goes with theory. So let's look at the collision theory. In order for any reaction to occur, you must have two things. Reactions must, must collide with each other, so they have to hit. When they do that, they, must, they may react together or they may not. Molecules must have sufficient energy, so they must collide and they must have enough energy. And also, they must have the correct geometry. So in order for reaction to occur, we have three things here that reactions molecules must collide, they must have enough energy, and they must have the correct geometry. So they're, they're something on a particle called an active site, and so when they collide, they must collide at that active site. So let's say, take the example, we have ozone react with nitrogen monoxide to produce O2 and nitrogen dioxide. So how does this reaction occur? Well, let's say we have the ozone with the NO. This, actually reacts because this is occurring close to the active site. As to oppose if we have ozone where the oxygen was adjacent to the other oxygen, this would not react because this is not with the correct geometry. You, the nitrogen must come in contact with the oxygen in order to form uh, nitrogen dioxide. The first reaction would occur, the second reaction would not occur because they're not colliding at the correct location with the correct geometry. And the other thing is you have an activated energy and an activated complex. So what is activated energy? It's the energy barrier that you have to overcome for any reaction to occur. So the amount of energy you need to go from reactants to the activated complex. Now the activated complex is just a chemical species with partially broken and partially formed bonds. It's what you have when you're going from reactants to products. It's always high energy, and it's, and it's because of, you have partial bonds. Let's look at the energy profile of the isomerization of methyl isonitrile. 
So we have the reactants would be on the lower part. So these are reactants. Their energy is right here. And the reactant energy of the products are right here. And we've talked about the substance before. All that ha actually happens is the nitrogen and the carbon flip sides. The nitrogen goes, uh, the carbon goes to where the nitrogen is, and the nitrogen goes where the carbon is. But in order for that to happen, you must have the minimum energy, and that is called the activation energy. Remember, activation energy is energy when you go from reactants to the top of the hill. So that would be the re uh, activation energy. And what we have at the top is what we call the activated complex. That's the structure we have when we go between reactants all the way down here to our products. So the, the activated complex we see and also the uh, reactants and products. Product, uh, remember, if the product is lower than the reactant, that means it's more stable. And since it's lower energy, also means it's an exothermic process. You, you should make the analogy activation energy. For example, if you hit this ball with just enough energy to get to the middle of the net, it will not go over. You have to have the minimum amount of energy in order to get the ball to go over the net. And so we could think of the energy at the top of the net as the top of the hill. And if you have anything less than that, the ball will not go over. Similarly, a reaction will not occur. So that's our last analogy, our last discussion for today. The idea of going for how much energy is needed for reaction occur, which is activated energy, the minimum amount. And uh, that's it. If you have any questions, let me know. We'll see you tomorrow.